Welcome to the podcast Sube de volumen Conversation with the people who were with me In the world TV Carlos tonight Carlos tonight Historias de un reportero Welcome to Carlos Tonight. Thank you so much for listening on your favorite podcast platform as well as for watching us. And it's always good to talk to a fellow journalist and a fellow podcaster. And I'm very excited to welcome Sandy Kay, who is on the podcast. Hey, Sandy, how are you? Hello, Carlos. I'm great. I'm so excited to be with you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. You're the host of A Breath of Fresh Air, and uh, I love your show. And it's basically, for those of you who haven't uh, listened to it, or um, it's basically the soundtrack of your own life where you explore some of the best music from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And you talk to the artists behind the music. Tell us why this has become your passion project. Yeah, it's, a, it's quite a long story. I was, um, I'm, a, I'm a journalist from years back, as you mentioned, and I think I kind of got stuck in my teenage years somewhere in terms of my musical taste. So all of the ones, I loved music. Well, who didn't love music when you were 14, 15, 18 years old, whatever you were? And, of course, all that music is still very much around today. So I was doing um, entertainment reports for various radio stations before the pandemic just as a bit of a sideline because my main gig was as a, a corporate media trainer and presentation trainer and, you know, that's how I made my money. And the pandemic came and the stations that I was doing these live entertainment reports for said to me, oh, do you think there's any way you could blow out your reports because a lot of our presenters are not coming in because of COVID? Mm -hmm. So, oh, okay, I, I always was one for a bit of a challenge. So I learned to build this, what was then a radio show, on my little laptop. And I built it according to the radio shows that I knew and loved. I've been a, um, a, a, a television reporter and, uh, and a current affairs reporter. I've had my own radio shows. I've been a radio producer for some of the big names here in Australia. So I knew about putting a show together. And most of all, I know about research. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that you're in exactly the same boat okay, right. because that's one of our greatest skills. And in the days pre-internet, people would say, but how do you go about finding people? Well, we have our ways, don't we? So I was always very good and I prided myself on being able to track down anybody anywhere in the world, even before you could Google them. Um, so I, I thought, okay, I'll rise to this occasion and, and build this radio show and I'll start reaching out to my favourite artists from when I was a teenager. And to my greatest surprise, many of them said yes. They were at home. They weren't on tour anywhere. They weren't making new music. They were caught in that vacuum that the pandemic gave us all. Yeah. And they said, yeah, we'll talk to you. So... I was scoring some pretty big names in, in entertainment, well, in music particularly, through the United States, through Canada, through the UK, and, and of course, here in Australia too. And uh, that was the, the, the birth of a breath of fresh air. It's been going probably you know, a little on two years. How long, have, how long has this pandemic been going? A little more than two years, I guess, now. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, I've got to say, finding them now is getting a bit more difficult because they're all out on tour and doing right. things and, and trying to make um, make up for the time that they lost. Mm -hmm. But I'm still getting a whole lot of great names. And what I like most about my podcast is the ability to kind of get behind the bravado that these performers come with to as, as a public face. So... I don't know if anybody listening has heard A Breath of Fresh Air, but I think it's aptly named because you can kind of sit back and get behind not only the songs that they made that you know all the words to, but behind them as people. And, and mm -hmm. I find it super interesting to hear about their musical journeys and their personal journeys too. What is it about that era in music that means so much to you? That's a really good question. I often ask myself that, and I think it's 
I think the time that we are most influenced by music is during our teenage years when we're when we're growing. I mean, I remember, you know, being at school and before we started off our school day, we would all gather in, in groups and, and put the music on loud and sing it all together and gee ourselves up for our daily, the daily grind of school, right? Um, or, you know, when you'd go dating with boys for the first time and you'd hear music in their cars and or you'd have your first kiss all that sort of stuff, and the music just takes you back to those days. Yeah. But I also think that the music, particularly of the 70s, and I, I guess that's really my, that was my heyday. I do take in, in this podcast, the music of the 60s because that was so formative, um, and the 80s on the other side, which I don't think is quite as good as the 70s. But the 70s was such a revolutionary time for music everybody was out there it was so creative and a lot of the musicians that are there today look back on on the, their days of making music and many of them are still making music today and say oh no the 70s were the heyday we'd come out of the 60s and the the whole vietnam war thing and you know it was all burn your bra and women's live and all that happening and the 70s we weren't hippies anymore. I was too young to actually have been a hippie, but growing up through the 70s, we were just free. Mm. There were no wars going on. Everyone was happy. It was all about just making ourselves, well, making fun, having fun. There was nothing else you had to worry about. You'd sneak out from, from under your parents' <laughs> clothes <laughs> off and, and you'd just go and party wherever you could. There weren't, you know, there were drugs around, of course, but not as heavy as, as drugs as there are today, it was just a great time to be living and, and playing and, and growing yeah. up through. Had a great time, right? <laughs> yeah. We uh, all, we had it all. <laughs> was there, when you were creating your podcast, was there an artist uh, that was like top of the list that you wanted to interview? And when that actually happened, what was that like? All right, let me, let me take you a step back. When I was about nine years old, you know, people often say to me, did you always want to interview people? Did you always want to be a journalist? And I guess this story kind of portrays it best. When I was about nine years old, my parents would go out on a Sunday afternoon. I'm not sure why they would leave me at home with my, he was then four-year-old brother. Mm -hmm. I, was the, I, I was the babysitter. But they'd go out and I would rearrange all of the sofas in the living room. And my mother had this single long-stemmed, bars for a rose it was blue china and that was my microphone and on the sofas i would assemble my favorite artists i mean you're too young carlos to remember but maybe some of the listeners will remember the dinah shaw show she was a super famous interviewer in in the states i think predominantly through the 60s and of course australia we were taking all the best television from the united states as well as the united kingdom at the time so i just wanted to be dinah shaw i wanted to talk to all the people <laughs> she talked to and at 9 years of age i had my imaginary people on the couch so i would interview elvis and i would interview a, a little bit later the monkeys came along and i would interview muhammad ali and you know, anybody I could think of every Sunday was interview day. Mm -hmm. I didn't think too much about that until later years. And, and as a young radio reporter in Sydney, in New South Wales here in Australia, I was sent on a job one day because Muhammad Ali was coming to Sydney. This was in, in the days when he was really well and at the, at the peak of his career. And I put my hand up. I said, I'm going to talk to Muhammad Ali. Absolutely, it's right, me. Yeah. So, yeah. They sent me out with my little recorder. I think it might have even been a cassette recorder. It was a cassette recorder right. at the time. It was that long ago. And we went to the hotel where he was going to address the waiting media. And he was taking so long to come there and everybody was just sitting, chatting. And I grew very restless. And I said to my buddy who was at that time reporting for our version of 60 Minutes, I said, come on, let's go and find his room. He said, okay. I can't remember how we found the room in this hotel. I do remember knocking on the door and the big man opened the door and he said, you go, you stay. 
and Michael, my friend, had to walk away with his tail between his legs and <laughs> I was in there with my tape recorder and for the next two hours I sat with Muhammad Ali going, you know, what do you think about this and what do you think about that? And I don't know if you've ever heard any of those dissertations that Muhammad Ali used to do. He gave me, and I only just discovered the, the cassette not, not very long ago. Oh, wow. I've still got it. He gave me a whole monologue on motivation by Muhammad Ali. Wow. It is incredible. I mean, apart from that, he also did all of these station IDs for me, you know. I'm Muhammad Ali. You're listening to 2WS Radio, you know. I was the star of the day. I bet, yeah. Yeah. So he was one of the guys that I had interviewed as a nine-year-old on my, my imaginary guest yeah. on my couch. And there I was as a 20-year-old um, really spending a long time with him. And we became quite friendly after that because he then travelled to Melbourne sometime later and I caught up with him again. And um, he, was, he was fabulous. He was just brilliant. I mean, he doesn't actually fit into my musical category at all, but he certainly fits into my hero category. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, what, what a great segue, because I was going to ask you, um, you know, because as journalists, we talk to pretty much everyone. Has there been a time where you were starstruck at someone? I know doing the podcast, I had interviewed um, Jono. He's a celebrity trainer out there where you are. And uh, when I first started talking to him, I was just kind of like nervous and like, oh, I can't believe I'm talking to you. I follow you on social media. Now you're right here on my show. So has there yeah. anyone been there for you like that? Yeah. Uh, Mickey Dolan's from the Monkeys got me. Oh, I love it. Got me good. Again, they've been on my couch as a nine-year-old. <laughs> and uh, as I grew through my teen years, I was, you know, monkey mad like like so many other girls. Well, particularly girls, but yeah, boys too, for sure. So I'd, I hadn't had the opportunity of, of uh, meeting them before and when I got to speak to Mickey in the very early days of my podcast uh, I was like I, I could not believe I turned into that 14 year old again yeah, it, was ridiculous. it happens I got right. off the phone and my partner who's also a journalist was staring at me I said, what the hell are you doing I said, you don't understand it was Mickey that's Mickey from the monkeys and he said you're crazy I said, but I was like bright red in the face and I, 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 I was 14 again. What can I tell you? It was Mickey. He did it to me. Wow. Yeah. What an amazing story. <laughs> uh, when, okay. So when talking to the art, to these artists, what do you, um, what do you think they have all in common? Passion. They all love the music. Uh, they live for the music They've all been completely broke to start off with mm -hmm. until they started to make money. They all lament the old days of not only uh, the music taking the front seat to everybody's lives but also paying the dollars. Yeah. Um, you know, that they, they all say that the whole, you know, modern way of, of, of making money from music, the licensing just sucks for them. And the only way they can make money is getting on the road. And, of course, many of the guys that I speak to these days, they're, well, they're all in their 70s and some of them in their 80s. And it's really difficult for them to travel these days. It's difficult for, for younger people to travel these days, as you'd well know. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you're dependent upon uh, making your living now by travelling from city to city and you can't do it quite as fast or... or, or uh, uh, as much as you used to do, then it becomes a little more difficult. So I find that they, they all have that in common also. A lot of them try and put on a front and say, oh, no, look, we still love performing in front of an audience and that's the best way of connecting. And they're, they're, and audiences obviously love seeing them live too. Um, the other thing I think that they all have in common is staying re trying to stay relevant yeah. um, instead of not simply being a nostalgia act mm -hmm. and uh, many of them are still making music today which is really great to see i spoke with graham nash from crosby stills nash and young just a few weeks ago and he's got a new album out which is awesome um 
so he's he says his creativity is still burning as bright today as it was 50 years ago. But also what he can't believe, and a lot of them express same, is that the songs that they wrote 50 years ago, mm-hmm. many of them war protest songs or environmental songs, that sort of stuff, are still so relevant today that the world really hasn't learned very much at all, as we know. Yeah. And um, the relevance is is amazing when you listen to the lyrics that they wrote 50 years ago it was almost like they were prophetic yeah. um and none of them knew that of course they didn't know that right. their songs or their careers would have such longevity and some of them have really powerful lyrics yeah um yeah when you were listening to the music back then and then you're getting to hear you know how the music all was created um, do you ever relate to any of the artists and how they started? How do you mean? Like, um, say you're listening to, I don't know, the monkeys, let's say, since we were just talking about them and talking, uh, to the artists and, and getting to know the backstory of how a song was developed. Um, do you, or do you often relate to, um, how it all started, how it was put together? For them. For them, yeah. Well, I I mean, growing up and listening to the music, I never spared a thought for what went on for the artist behind that music. Mm. So for me, it's a real education these days to go, ah, that's why you thought of that song. Oh, that's what those lyrics mean. Had no idea. Mm. For instance, there was a song by a Canadian man called Five Man Electrical Band and the song was Signs. I don't know if you know that one. Mm. It was a big hit in, in the States. But, you know, he was t- he was telling me that they were driving through America on one highway somewhere uh, for the first time when they got a gig, when they were able to cross the border from Canada um, because they were invited to play in the States. And he was just totally struck by the number of signs, don't do this, cross here, slow down there all the signage coming at him and that's what he wrote this song about <laughs> and, you know as a teenager you know i know all the words to that song but i had no idea that that's what he was writing about and there are a ton of songs like that 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 i'd never spared a thought for what those words actually mean mm. and it's funny because some of the artists say to me also that you know i said what were you writing about oh nothing I said, what do you mean nothing? It was like a, such an important song to me. You know, it was my first kiss or it was my first date or the first time I held a hand with a boy or whatever. What were you writing? No, nothing. <laughs> for, me, for many of them, they talk about the songs dropping like manna from heaven into mm-hmm. their lap, right. that they have to do nothing to do to get this at all other than be aware that the words are there or the musicality is there and they have to quickly write it down. Mm -hmm. I had never, ever heard of that before. I didn't know that songwriting was like that. Who who did I speak to the other day? Oh, Graham Gouldman from 10CC. He's written tonnes of songs for for bands like The Hollies, for... um, Oh, uh, too many to even mention, but I'm most well-known for the band 10CC. And uh, 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 some of those songs also, I said to him, what were you writing about? Oh, nothing. It just came to me. Mm-hmm. It just came to me. So what do you mean it just came to you? How does that happen? I guess you have to be really lucky for it to happen, for it to drop into your lap. Right. And then it turns to be a song. He said, well, he said, it's interesting that I hear from many fans that it becomes so important to them. It takes on so much meaning for the people who listen to it but for me, it actually didn't have any meaning at all. So it's kind of disappointing in a way that that there wasn't all this profound thought that went into some of these songs, that they, they're just gifts from mm. I don't know where. That's great insight. Are there other things that kind of surprise you when you talk to these artists? Um, yeah, kind of the, the bigger the artist, the more down to earth they are. That's okay. kind of surprising too. Um you know, I, I reached out, as I said, to, to some of my heroes and uh, many of them were so lovely. Uh, I, I have to say Gordon Lightfoot was one of my 
I, re I really liked Gordon Lightfoot's music a lot. I, again, I came to him late. I, I, he started off before my time. But I was really keen on getting an interview with him. And uh, Gordon Lightfoot's now 83 years old. And it was kind of like talking to somebody's grandfather with their hearing aid out. Yeah. It was a really, I think that was probably the worst interview I've ever had to do. And it was so disappointing because I, I mean, he had great stories to tell, but it was really difficult to pulling understand. them out of him. Somebody like Dion DiMucci, on the other hand, who's the same age, is young and vital and, and uh, so energetic at 83 and making the amazing new music. He lives in Florida and he's, uh, you know, doing music with Springsteen and, and uh, a whole lot of other people. He's just, he's almost at the peak of his career now and he'd wow. started way back in the 50s. I, what, what, what I can't believe is that these guys who started when they were often teenagers themselves, even sometimes before they were teenagers, they started playing music and they had decided that that's their passion and that's one, what they want to do. I'm amazed at how passionate they are still about it 50, sometimes 60 years later. They've given their entire lives wow. to music that's and beautiful. to making other people happy. Yeah. yeah. That's beautiful. What, what do you think you're learning about yourself through your show and talking to these artists? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I think I learned that I'm not as good an interviewer as I thought I was. <laughs> um, you, as you started off saying, as journalists, we we have to be good at talking to all sorts of people, whether it's, you know, the, the, the guy picking up the garbage outside right up to the Queen of England, who, who I didn't actually get to speak to also. Oh, yeah. um, and and everybody in between. And the 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 most important quality about being an interviewer, and I'm sure you'll agree, is A, curiosity, mm -hmm. and B, your ability to listen. So as time goes on and I'm speaking, I've spoken to, I don't know, hundreds if not thousands of these guys already. I'm going to have to run out soon because many of them are already passing over and, and some of the ones I've spoken to are no longer here anymore either. Um, I'm still very curious about them, but a lot of the stories are now starting to look, be a little bit same, same. Yeah. And what I'm learning about myself is that I have to dig a little bit deeper to, to really get the differences out because it's kind of easy to just, you know, ask the same old questions and then you, you kind of, I'm starting to get the same old answers every interview and then, the, the interviews are the same, doesn't matter who I'm speaking to. So I'm trying to find now different ways to elicit different responses, different parts of them. Mm. And they're all very forthcoming. You know, I can get quite deep and meaningful and intimate with them uh, in ways that I think somebody less trained perhaps wouldn't be able to. Mm -hmm. Well, firstly, I'm not sure that they'd be able to get them in the first place. Yeah, But uh, I tend to make friends with them and and you know i'm i'm desperately waiting for the australian dollar to go back up against against the us dollar so i can travel again because i've got uh, appointments everywhere with all, some of these guys that i would love to meet in person not just over a screen oh, sure. so I'm, I'm learning i'm not quite as good as i thought i was yeah. i'm learning that i have to do things a little bit differently you can't just rest on your laurels and do it the same way each time um and I think I'm learning to like 80s music a little bit more than I yeah. ever did. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> Do you have any plan, any future plans on um, taking any of those interviews and maybe putting them in, in a book? Yeah, I, I've been thinking about that. I, I saw uh, a publisher in Norway that I know has actually just published a book of a, of a music journalist with uh, several interviews. And I thought when I finish doing this, uh, I, that's probably exactly what I'll do because the stories are phenomenal. And then I'll travel the road and get first-hand photos of them all too before they all go. But you know what happened to me? I have to share something with you, Carlos. You'll be able to relate. For the last, I mean, I've been doing these interviews before it was even a podcast 
as I said, it was a radio show. And before it was a radio show, it was part of my uh, entertainment reports and I'd just be using grabs or snippets of these interviews for, for radio broadcast. And I'd been storing everything on an external hard drive. I hadn't been backing it up to the cloud, only on the external hard drive. Oh, I had a two terabyte hard drive that contains two years worth of radio shows and raw interviews. And a few weeks ago, the hard drive failed. Oh no. And it continued to fail. And it's one of those Seagate ones. Anyway, a very nice young man uh, who works for Seagate for Lacey, who resides in Costa Rica, helped me out and said, look, we'll extend your warranty and you'll have to send the hard drive off to our headquarters to go to the lab in the Netherlands. So very reluctantly, I've sent this entire library of all my interviews for them to try and retrieve the data. I'll keep you posted whether they actually manage to. I won't have it back for at least a month or more. Oh, yeah. But uh, if, if they can't retrieve the data, then all my hopes for doing a book are dashed. And in fact... I think I've decided that if they if they can't retrieve that data, I, 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 I think that's a sign that I'll get oh, my wow. life back. Well, I'll keep my fingers crossed and say a little prayer. <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs> wow, okay. And by the way, I wore this shirt, uh, Selena's shirt from the Grammys ah. for this interview. <laughs> Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Because, of course, you don't specialize in music, do you? You you talk to people all over the place. Yeah, all walks of life. Um, we got actors. We've got uh, personal trainers, producers, writers, everyone. Oh, it keeps it interesting. Who's your favorite musical star? Because what I do with my listeners too, and I think what makes A Breath of Fresh Air unique is that I always ask listeners to write in to me and request a guest. Tell me who you want to hear from from the 60s, 70s and 80s. I'm following my nose and, and the guests that I liked, but if you've got a, a, a special one that you'd like to hear from, let me know. And people are writing to me from everywhere asking me. I had a request from Nick Kershaw, for Nick Kershaw in, in the UK for... Um, for Roy Wood from ELO, for Wayne Nelson from Little River Band, for mm. I'm getting them from everywhere. For Steve Winwood, who would if you? Well, I'd like to dedicate a request to you, Carlos. I'll put the, you on. I think the um, the person that I think of when you were talking just now is Carlos Santana. Got it. I shall <laughs> write it down. I'll chase him up. He hasn't been in very good health of late. Yeah, but I will. Put, he's doing a, a, I know he's doing a Las Vegas residency at the moment. Mm -hmm. I will reach out to him and, and if I can get him, then I'm going to put Carlos on with Carlos on A Breath of Fresh Air. Perfect. Awesome. Thank <laughs> you so much. I love that. That would be good. And anybody who's listening, if you would like to request a guest on A Breath of Fresh Air, just send me a message through that website, abreathoffreshair.com. Dot au. You have to put the AU because I'm in Australia. Mm -hmm. So AU is for Australia. Perfect. And I will um, put that in the show notes so people will know and uh, connect with you and, and talk with you. Sandy Kay, host of A Breath of Fresh Air. Thank you for being here and continued success. God bless you. Thank you so much for having me, Carlos. A real pleasure. And that's all the time we have. Thanks so much for watching and for listening to this episode of Carlos Tonight. It was written and produced by yours truly, Carlos Correa. My theme by Skin Gallus. And you can check out my website, carlostonight.com, where you can find the latest on the podcast, see upcoming guests, and check out past episodes. That's carlostonight.com. Yeah,